Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. I am delighted to be here with Alan Kakoni. Alan, great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks for showing some interest. So I'm here to help. Alan, to start, would you tell me, please, your current or most recent title and institutional affiliation? Uh, none. I'm sort of semi-retired, doing occasional consulting work or developing products on my own. What kind of consulting work are you doing right now and for what industries? Uh, right now I have no active projects for any customers. Uh, I'm actually doing stuff that interests me in terms of software for electronic instrumentation, for signal analysis and electronic instrumentation. That's what I'm spending my time on. Alan, how long have you been retired from full-time work? Uh, Probably ever since I left AC Propulsion in about 2001, I've been not really doing full-time work, just doing various projects that interest me, often without a paying customer, but sometimes with one. Right. Uh, uh, I actually had a major health scare in around that time, which caused me to reevaluate what I wanted to do. And uh, so that's kind of what led me to starting to do the solar UAV project. When did the solar UAV project get started? Uh, around 2001 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it led to the 2005 24 hour, sorry, 48 hour flight, which is the world's first UAV to do that on solar power. So that took a lot of my time. And as a spin off of that, uh, lithium batteries for electric cars came off out of that work. So some of these projects initially seemed pretty useless, but they ended up creating various spinoffs that were useful. <laughs> Alan, I'd like to ask some very general questions about electric vehicles in historical perspective. So just to get a sense of how far back you go, what is your earliest memory of thinking about electrifying vehicles, developing alternatives to gas-powered automobiles? Uh, one, Alec Brooks and the others at Air Rimer suggested that I work with them on the Sunracer project. That was my first involvement with electric vehicles at all. Now, the Sunracer project, of course, was solar powered. So what is your understanding of the intellectual trajectory or jump from solar powered to battery powered automobiles? Well, having worked in the Sunrace, it was clear that solar powered vehicles were unlikely to be practical for everyday use. I mean, that car was an extreme vehicle meant for that purpose, but it was a car that was the size of a large station wagon and, and weighed 300 pounds and it could carry one person. It wasn't terribly practical. Uh, so it was clear then that solar power was not really the answer, but the electric propulsion certainly had possibility. And, and that project was kind of my introduction to electrical ve electric vehicles. Alan, today, of course, driving around Pasadena, Teslas are probably the most common car that you'll see on the road, at least here in this part of Southern California. When did you start to see electric vehicles becoming a viable contender, not just technologically, but as a matter of market share in the industry? Well, I think the EV1 project showed that it could be done. Unfortunately, nothing happened right then in terms of manufacturing on any significant scale. But intellectually, it was obvious after the EV1 project that, uh, or the impact at the time that this was all possible. It was just a question of the will to do it. Given and as soon as the lithium batteries came in the picture in the early 2000s with, from the laptop industry, uh, then it became even more clear that this could be a, really a very viable solution and could meet most, most people's needs for transportation. Alan, given the viability of EV1, are you surprised that right now in 2021, electric vehicles remain a niche market overall? No, I, I know how reluctant the industry is to embrace any change, and it took a really company like Tesla that wasn't part of the original industry to force a change, and that's why they have 80% or so of the market right now, because they were willing to embrace something new and different while the others were, in many ways, fighting against it. What is your understanding of how Elon Musk drew inspiration from AC Propulsion? 
Uh, he's not the one who started Tesla. It was uh, Martin Eberhard who started Tesla. Elon Musk, in my opinion, his main skill is getting other people's money. Uh, he does that very well. Uh, so that enabled him to scale up and, and create what is now known as Tesla. But I don't think he had vision other than recognizing that the technology was available and Martin Eberhard had started doing the Tesla Roadster on his own with, with his efforts but didn't have the financial resources to take it to the level that was required. And that's where Elon Musk came in. So I don't give Elon Musk for a whole lot of credit for technological insight other than recognizing viable technologies when he sees them. Alan, what do you see as some of the key technological and infrastructural challenges to make EVs the dominant way of getting around in automobiles? I think the technology is there, which is lacking most now in the industry, including Tesla, is good vehicle design. It's got good components, but many of your vehicles fall far short of what is possible with current technology. What do you so, have in mind? What does good vehicle design I, look like? I mean, the, 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 these, the vehicles currently that all the automakers are making tend to be, in my opinion, are much too heavy and too inefficient. They, with more careful design, you could get a lot more range out of the same battery and less energy use per mile with probably 30% improvements easily available. What about safety considerations? The idea that a heavier automobile is a safer automobile? I think that's a nonsense argument. I mean, if we all drive a big rig trucks, then obviously everybody's equally unsafe. So, and we flatten pedestrians much more quickly. So I don't think that's a viable argument. And in terms of global warming, the important thing is to use less energy to get where you're going. And the only way to do that is with a lighter vehicle. And with modern design techniques, a light vehicle can be made quite safe. In fact, the big heavy SUVs have a worse safety record in terms of passenger deaths per, per mile driven than the smaller cars, if you look at the actual record. Alan, that gets me to a very important point, and that is getting a sense of your overall motivation. So where for you is it about bigger, faster, stronger? And where is no, it about... No, it's not bigger, faster, stronger. The, I'm kind of guilty for, for pushing the performance aspect of electric vehicles, but that was a gimmick at the time. I didn't expect to be taken so seriously. Uh -huh. And I, I think it's the wrong thing. Right now, everybody's pushing for these fantastic acceleration times in electric cars and super high top speeds and all this stuff is totally unnecessary and counterproductive. It's not what's needed. Uh, what's needed is the car with reasonable performance and the cost-effective use of resources, meaning a smaller battery for longer range, fast recharging, the smaller battery is easier to charge quickly, you need lower power infrastructure to do it, and the impact on the, on the world's resources are reduced if you go with that approach. And everybody talks about the environmental impacts of the lithium mining and everything, all those other aspects. And if you build electric Hummers like GM's proposing, that's about the worst thing you can do with this technology. So for you, the motivation is really about careful use of the world's resources. Yes. Is that to say that, you know, all of these YouTube videos about the Tesla Model S beating Lamborghinis and things like that, that's all nonsense and, and, and counterproductive? I think it's all nonsense, and by now it's getting old. I mean, any idiot engineer can make a car that's fast. That's not difficult to do. The difficult thing is make a car that's efficient. <laughs> what do you see as the next generation beyond lithium-ion? Uh, I'm not a battery chemist. I more or less observe what comes out, and uh, so far... There's some talk about the various variations of lithium with solid state batteries, et cetera, which show some promise. But in fact, the lithium iron batteries are kind of good enough for what you need. They're not the stumbling block right now. And making a vehicle that needs less of these raw materials is the most important thing. So I think what's lagging the most is the vehicle design. Um, you know, so the new, the new cars coming out from Volkswagen to GM to Tesla, and they all strike me as very poor vehicle design. Given that big automobile companies are investing heavily in EV nowadays, what role do you see, if at all, for startups in the 21st century? Uh, less. I mean, uh, you know, AC Propulsion played a major role because nobody else was doing that work. 
And now it's kind of beyond that stage. It's one of the reasons I left AC Propulsion and sold off the company. Because I saw that kind of the role of the small player was being, had kind of come and gone to a large extent. Given now that. The big, now you have to have enormous manufacturing capability to do anything in the industry. Given that you're critical of some of the designs coming out of the big automakers, best case scenario, what, what do you want to see coming off the production line? I want to see efficient, practical cars that are that can replace the vast majority of people's daily transportation with something that is less resource intensive. So if you look at, you know, vehicles have been evolving to be larger and heavier every year over the last few decades. And that trend needs to change if we're going to address some of these global environmental issues. Alan, when did you really, in your own intellectual development, become sensitive to environmental issues. How far back does that go? Ever since the beginning of my electric vehicle work, my own, I guess I've always been active outdoors and enjoy cycling and hiking and always resented the smog and various other pollution aspects. The global warming stuff at the time wasn't a big issue and really I wasn't that aware of it. And in certainly the last 10 or 15 years, the global warming aspects become a major one. <laughs> Are you old enough to remember smog in Pasadena, or is that was that clear? Yes, I remember up? not being able to breathe and having to use an inhaler to ride my bicycle. Right, right, and you directly and connected. Remember. You directly connected this to automobile emissions. Yes, and it was connected. In fact, when the catalytic converters cleaned up the air substantially, it got a lot better. What role do you see in terms of emissions overall as 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 EVs? become more and more common? I think it'll help emissions. I mean, there's still other issues like now heavy duty vehicles are responsible for a large part of the emissions and they're only now beginning to make more strict emission controls on those. So that'll help a lot as well. But I mean, in terms of CO2 emissions, I mean, it's not just the other pollutants, this electric vehicles certainly help because it's been a transition to renewables for the electricity grid ties in well with the switch to EVs. You mentioned you mentioned bigger vehicles. Do you see semis, big rigs becoming electrified? Do you think that's a viable technology? I think it's viable for in-town deliveries where they don't drive long distances. I don't think it's yet viable for long cross-country hauls. Why is that? Because uh, the energy requirements are much higher and the recharge infrastructure to charge these big trucks at a rapid rate will be very expensive. So it. Uh, as usual, with the new technology, do what works best first. Don't try to do the impossible stuff. So what could work very well is for all the, the tractor trailers that do the deliveries in town, you know, and, and, and coalesce the cargo to the main warehouses, that could certainly switch to electric. They don't drive that many miles in a day. The people who drive 1,000 miles a day, the electric still isn't. That, that competitive and economically with others. Alan, just out of curiosity, what do you drive? Right now, I drive a Hyundai, Hyundai Kona. Uh-huh. Electric. I chose Hyundai because I really, Elon Musk has been a very distasteful person, in my opinion. The way he's, my interactions with him were not pleasant, and I have not enjoyed his, his various sort of communications. Uh, <laughs> to the world. And also Tesla's are too luxurious for my appeal. And uh, Hyundai Kona is a more efficient vehicle. It's actually lighter and slightly more efficient than the Model 3. So the Hyundai and, uh, sounds like it's a little closer to your ideal of a, of a more reasonable. It's still not great. And the ironic thing is that the Hyundai is a conversion from a production gas vehicle. It's not a purpose designed electric. And almost by accident, Hyundai did a pretty good job. Can you explain a little bit of the engineering, why it's so much better to have a purpose-built electric car from the get-go? It could be much better if your intentions are good, but showing that Hyundai can pretty much do a very good job with the gasoline conversion shows how bad the purpose-built ones are. Alan, what about the Chevy Bolt? What are your feelings about the Bolt? It's an okay car. Again, not a great chassis. It's, it's, it's reasonable. They messed up on their battery with various issues, which Hyundai has some of the same issues, but not quite as bad. 
and uh, so they've had to do some recalls, which is unfortunate. It help, doesn't help for the PR. But the vehicle's okay. It's kind of not a very spectacular vehicle in any dimension. On the other hand, it's quite practical, and the costs are okay. So it, it's been a good stepping stone, and I wish they'd learn from it and do something better. Instead, now they're concentrating on these pickup trucks and Humvees, which is ridiculous. Are there any EVs coming to market that you're excited about, or at least demonstrate a step in the right direction? No, none that I'm currently aware of. I still, I still look at my Hyundai I bought two years ago, and I don't see anything I like better. Ah, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> in fact, the new Hyundai, which is purpose built, is less in the direction that I like. It's got some interesting technology for faster recharge and some other things in the power electronics, which, if put in a good car, would be nice. But the new Hyundai emulates the Tesla Model S. Well, Alan, to give a sense of, 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 of all of this in context, let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Let's start first with your parents. Tell me a little bit about them. Uh, they were both nuclear physicists, and they were working at Stern in Geneva, Switzerland, as I grew up, and that's where I grew up. And so I was brought up in a house, you know, discuss science often, etc., and there were also avid mountaineers on the weekends. They loved going to the mountains and hiking and eating, etc. Where did so your the, parents grow up? What? Where did your they, parents grow up? They were Italian. Up? They both grew up in Italy, and they worked at Cornell for 15 years. So I'm an American citizen, so I was born while they were at Cornell. <laughs> Did you understand how pathbreaking it was for your mom to be a nuclear physicist? Yeah, she talked about that quite a bit, and she was one of the few. And at if her generation, just about all the female nuclear physicists were Italian. <laughs> yeah. Which, inter which was interesting. <laughs> Did you speak to your parents more in Italian or in English? Uh, some of each. They spoke to me in Italian, and I responded in English. was kind of off in the pattern. Uh-huh. <laughs> And where, where, some of each. Did you, where did you grow up? What years were you in Europe and what years were you in the United States? I left the U.S. when I was four years old, so it was not very significant in my education or anything. So I, from four to 18, I was living in Switzerland. Now, it's interesting. I don't detect any accent at all. What, what might explain that? I went to an English-speaking school. I went to an international school in Geneva where I was surrounded by other English speakers, so my English was developed there, and I spoke French as well, and I still do, but uh, that, that was my upbringing. I, I took the international baccalaureate program in high school, and then went to school, applied to Caltech and came to California. Alan, did your parents involve you in their work at all? Did you have a good sense of what, of what physicists did for a living? Some. I was never really into the nuclear physics, sort of quantum mechanics type stuff that they were, so that was less my interest. I was always more engineering and, and hands-on oriented and the more theoretical aspect of what they were doing, even though they're experimental physicists. But I, no, I went in with my parents to work on a while, looked around and liked, enjoyed seeing all the technology used in their work. That was always interesting for me. Now, did you consider schools both in Europe and the U.S., or you specifically wanted to come to the U.S.? I applied to Cambridge in England and didn't get in, and then the best uh, several universities in the U.S. U.S. accepted me and ended up going to Caltech. Why Caltech? I guess because my parents encouraged me to, which I'm not sure was the best choice in the end. I had a very difficult time at Caltech. Sort of, I, I was not happy there. Tell me about that. What were some of your challenges? Uh, it was a very sort of non-social atmosphere and very intense. And I had an advisor who was very unhelpful. And I probably should have switched advisor as they recommended. I, other students told me I should in my freshman year, but I didn't listen to them. And, the, and afterwards, it was kind of too late to do it. But uh, I had I struggled academically at Caltech and found that the instruction was really aimed, each department taught as if you were going to specialize in that department. So as an engineer, I had a lot of trouble with the math instruction being oriented to math majors, not to engineers. And I, I felt that hurt me overall. What, what was your like, major at Caltech? Engineering and applied science, mainly electronics. 
Did you have any laboratory work that was that was uh, helpful for you? Yeah, the electronic stuff was fine. And I worked with Dr. Middlebrook and Dr. Chook in parallel electronics quite a bit and took their courses. Those I thoroughly enjoyed. That's the area I went into. And uh, some things at Caltech were great, like access to machine shops and equipment to do whatever interested you as a student. So I, I took advantage of that. That was great at Caltech. The actual way the courses were taught and the academic environment, I found, was incredibly brutal. Now, were you a tinkerer? Did you spend as much time as you could in shop making stuff? Yeah, I did, and that kind of probably hurt me academically some. <laughs> now, as you said earlier, even back then, you were sensitive to the idea that smog was a real problem and that there could be solutions in electric vehicles. No, I was not. That's too early. No, nope, I was not involved in that at all. My only interest then was getting a career that was not military because I didn't want to contribute to the military effort anywhere in the world. So that was my concern. In fact, when I first went to Caltech, I thought I'd do aeronautics, and then I realized it was impossible to do a non-military career in aeronautics. So I kind of switched to electronics, thinking to be more versatile. Now... At what point did you decide to stay on, even if only briefly, as a grad student at Caltech? Again, I was involved with a power electronics group run by doctors Middlebrook and Chook, and their work was interesting, and I was doing well there. And so after graduation, they offered me a full scholarship for a graduate program. Why ultimately did you not stay in the program? Because I was too burned out academically and realized that I wasn't doing well and I would be happier outside of Caltech. Did you have a sense that you wanted to stay in Southern California? Did you think about returning to Europe? Uh, not being a Swiss citizen, it would have been difficult to return to Europe. I had no rights there since my parents were there under diplomatic status. The way it works, it, it, even though I grew up there, I couldn't just move back. What opportunities were available to you? Uh, in the U.S., I mean, basically, I've worked... What happened is when I left Caltech, I worked for a company created by the same two professors who are running the power electronics department at Caltech. So I worked for their company for two years. What for was... me, it was a very easy transition. It was offered to me, and I got to do work outside of academics in an area I liked, and I did well there. And that was kind of the start of my career was the two years I spent at Teslica. Now, Teslica, of course, there's no relation to Tesla, but is there... No, not at all, other than... Everybody involved in power electronics likes the name Tesla. <laughs> I see. So it all it still goes back to Nikola Tesla. It goes back to Nikola Tesla, but not, that's it. It's just a, a fascination with the character, you know? <laughs> Tell me about Teslica. How did it get started? At what point did you join? Oh, Tesla Co.? Yeah. It had, it had just been founded by the two professors to, to, to get some research and R&D contracts for power electronics development using some of the technology that had been developed at Caltech. So it was a small company of three or four people just doing power electronics R&D. I wonder if you can explain. The words seem like they would make sense, but if you can explain, what, what exactly is the field of power electronics? Is, is uh, using electronics to process power, meaning... You're not processing information, but you're taking power in one form, for example, from a solar panel and converting it to another form, which is, you know, AC power to run your house. That's an example of power electronics. Uh, the little wall warts that run your, or, or bricks that run your laptop are also an example of power electronics because they take the AC from the power line and convert it to the power your laptop needs, which sounds trivial, but if you look at the details, there's actually a lot of quite sophisticated engineering in there to make these things so compact and efficient and quiet and everything else. <laughs> Alan, what was the mission or what were some of the, the, the imagined clients of Tesla Co? Uh, they were doing various custom power supplies for various companies in the them for their products. And the, one of the major contracts I worked on there was from Sandia National Labs for one of the they were giving out contracts to develop photovoltaic converters for rooftop solar installations. So I developed an initial unit for that application under under their contract. And that's where I learned a lot of the techniques for the higher power electronics that served me well later. 
Now, was this the very early beginnings of the adoption of rooftop solar panels in California? Yes, it was the very beginning of it, and there were there were research contracts available to develop electronics to support that industry. I wonder if you see a similar historical trajectory to the EV1, where there was something viable, but it was not adopted nearly early enough. Uh, I think the solar probably had a smoother time. It was gradually adopted. Even then, there were various installations being put in place. Well, the EV1, kind of everything died completely after that project ended. Uh, <laughs> so the solar was more of a continuum, and the solar panels were still relatively expensive at the time, so they weren't that cost competitive with other energy sources. And it really took the cost of the silicon panels to come down substantially to make the final explosive growth we've seen in the last years. Now, when you left Teslaco in 1983, was the company still viable? Did you have yes, your it own? It was opportunity? viable, but I had developed an interest in doing UAV work. I, and, I wonder uh, if you can explain I what didn't you have any customers. What what are, I, I, what are UAVs, Alan? Unmanned air vehicles, sort of remotely operated aircraft with video links and telemetry links and capability of flying many miles from the control site. Now, how did you get in involved or interested initially in UAVs? Well, I'd always been a model airplane nut my whole life, ever since I was 10 years old. So it was, as I learned electronics, it was a logical progression to apply the electronics to the model airplane. And at the time, the, the video cameras were just becoming available and all that, the smaller ones. So I realized it would be kind of fun to start playing with this stuff. And I met somebody, a friend of mine, who was doing some of this stuff for, actually for the military industry, who became involved in the Predator project later, what became the Predator UAV. But uh, I knew him before he ever worked on that. And he, seeing the work he was doing kind of inspired me. I would just be a fun area to get involved in and develop some hardware and learn how to make all these systems. And so I basically quit my job and lived off, lived off savings for over a year working on developing these aircraft, and I spent a lot of time doing it. Now, given your sensitivity as an undergraduate to not working or being involved in the, in the military industry, did you recognize the, the obvious military potential of UAVs? Was that something you were yes, concerned I about? Yes, I did, but I was hoping to find some commercial applications. And I, was, I didn't have a customer, so at some point I was just doing it on my own for my own interest. Uh, eventually, part of the air now, of, of, uh, was it Dale Reed at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, who wasn't actually involved in military stuff, he was involved in basic aero research stuff, uh, was made aware of my work, and he ordered one of my complete systems. Now, were you essentially working out of your garage? Did you have any startup money to help you out? No, I had no startup money at all. I was working out of my apartment in Pasadena initially, and then I bought a house out here in Glendora, which is still the house I live in. So I started doing UAV work out of a rented apartment in Pasadena, and then uh, continued in when I bought a house in, uh, in Glendora when I was doing some simultaneous consulting work for MK Products doing a welding power supply to allow me to buy the house. So I had some paying work doing power supply work for MK products and doing UAV work at the same time. And the, and the Edwards project came along about that time. Alan, what were some of the materials you considered as you were developing UAV prototypes? Well, at the time, I think was, I was doing everything out of fiberglass because carbon fiber wasn't yet very affordable. It was, you know, fiberglass, epoxy, and and all the electronics to make the things work and developing, you know, autopilot systems, et cetera, for the UAVs. So th that was what I was working with. And I was building everything from scratch. I wasn't buying existing components. Because first of all, there was hardly anything in the market then, not like now where all sorts of people selling UAV components. Back then, there was nothing. So I was scratch building everything from tracking antenna systems to the controls and instrumentation, et cetera. So that was a good education. Alan, what did you learn about yourself as a salesman or a self-promoter as you were trying to get people aware of what you were doing? I wasn't very good at that. In fact, I, that work, the UAV work never really paid for itself, but it was interesting intellectually. That didn't really bother me much. 
How did you get on, on uh, how did you capture NASA's attention for this? Uh, just introductions through friends, etc. What would NASA have done really with the UAV? I never them directly. It was somebody told them about the work I did, and then they contacted me. What was NASA's interest in UAVs? What were some potential applications? Uh, they were using them to do various tests of aerodynamic configurations of uh, for you no know, various uh, just exploring different ways of designing aircraft and being able to test initial concepts unmanned was useful to them. That so they wanted to develop that technology. Tell me about some of your consulting work for NK Products during this time. That was my first major consulting project on my own after leaving Teplico. And that came through, I think they called Caltech asking if they any com- they knew any students that wanted to do consulting, and somehow they got my name and uh, through, the, through the department secretary, I believe. And so that's how I got that contact. And uh, they're a welding, power, a welding company making all kinds of welding equipment, and they wanted to develop a new high-tech power supply for their welders. And so I worked with them for two years or maybe slightly more overall to develop what became the MK2000, which I think was a 15 kilowatt portable welder. What are some of the quite, considerations quite at the time? What are some of the considerations for for coming up with power supplies for welding equipment? Uh, it's, it's, at the time, it was the highest power project I'd ever done with you know 15 kilowatts or so, and it was learning how to handle high power stuff and do it in a way that was controlled and setting up all the equipment to test them and develop it. So it was, it was quite a job and the MK Products was willing to support it. And they'd hired somebody previously to try and do it who'd had very little success. So I was their second consultant on the project and ended up basically starting from scratch. But I was successful and made a product that worked for them for many years. Alan, did you specifically want to remain a consultant? Did you ever think about going in-house for any of your clients? Uh, I guess as a student at Caltech, I got a two-year scholarship from GM where I worked as an intern at the GM Research Labs. And that kind of taught me I really never wanted to work for a large corporation. Yeah. I didn't fit in very well. It wasn't my character. So getting consulting jobs was attractive. And when it started to work out, I said, well, fine, I'll continue with that. And financially, you found that it was stable? You were able to make ends meet? Yeah, I was consulting worked well, and it was fine. Again, I've always lived in a pretty simple manner, so I didn't have enormous financial aspirations. Uh, <laughs> as long as I make enough to keep on doing the other side projects I wanted to do, I was happy. Alan, how did you first get involved with AeroVironment? Uh, when I developed the UAV system, I contacted Alec Brooks because I knew he was at Air Environment. I knew they were doing various aircraft projects. And I set up to go over there and gave a presentation, you know, showing the hardware I developed and the systems I developed and told them if they ever had any non-military contracts, I'd be happy to work with them. Now, did and you know Did you know Alec from, from Caltech? I know Caltech, yeah. We both, we both used the same student machine shops, etc. He was a couple years ahead of me, but I knew him through the various sort of on-campus uh, facilities available for students. For, for He was building human-powered vehicles at the time in the student machine shop. I was building model helicopters. So, <laughs> And where we were, where was AeroVironment at that point? How developed were they? They were in Monrovia, and they were in Monrovia, and they were doing various... They, they'd done some of the solar-powered air, uh, human-powered aircraft and some solar power, like the one that flew across the English Channel or did the first, you know, human-powered aircraft stuff with Paul McCready. So I knew they were involved in various aircraft projects, which were interesting. What about some of their work with cars? Uh, I don't think they'd done anything with cars before that that I was aware of. So Sun Racer was still on the horizon at this point. Yeah, and uh, the Air Environment had no experience with cars at that time, as far as I know. Right, right. Alan, what was your first project with Air Environment in 1986? With the Pterodactyl. Yeah, tell me about that. It's a wonderful story. How did that get started? Uh, that, I wasn't involved at all in the start of that. I, I read about Air Environment getting the contract in the LA Times. 
And I remember reading about it and thinking, oh, I guess they might be calling me because that kind of falls into the category that I discussed with them. And I remember having that, making that comment to my girlfriend at the time, and she kind of laughed at me. You, you read an article in the LA Times, you think they're going to call you? But they did. Uh, <laughs> and that's how I got involved, because then actually a lot of the technology I developed for the UAVs went into the pterodactyl. What what was the project making a, a flying repli replica of a pterodactyl? What was this for? Yeah, it was an eighteen foot wingspan flying bird with flapping wings and various stability augmentation systems to make it work without a tail and a big head up front. So it was wasn't all that different from the UAVs I'd done. It had some different specific requirements and a very ungainly airframe to work with. But we did our best to make it work for the film. Tell me about the film. What was what was it about? The film was on the history of flight, and it was you know, the usual IMAX thing with lots of visuals and not a whole lot of storyline. But it started out with the evolution of animal flight and then showed man starting to make the first aircraft and with the Wright brothers onwards. And then disclosed that some of the animal flight video made at the beginning was actually the replica bird. So it was kind of a, tried to make the full circle between man-made and, and, and natural flight. What were some of the key engineering challenges in this project? Uh, getting a very unstable airframe to fly straight. <laughs> the birds have a, a brain and quick reflexes. I mean, the, the, we'll call it a bird. Well, it kind of was. It was a dinosaur, which is a bird. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was a, an airframe that would, didn't want to fly straight on its own and had to have all sorts of active controls to keep it pointing straight ahead. And so it, it was a challenge to get all the controls to work in a manner that was barely enough to make it fly straight for the film. We never got it to flap hard enough to climb because when we did that, it became unstable. So they cheated a bit with the cameras and made, made it look like it was flapping and climbing, but it actually was flapping and gliding. Uh, did you work directly with Alec on this? Yeah, I worked with Alec and the others on the team, and, and I developed electronics in my shop and went over there and spent a lot of time in Monrovia integrating the whole thing and working on the whole project and involved in the flight test, et cetera. So, yeah, I worked, worked, worked with him quite a bit. Now, the idea, as you said before, that your experience with GM convinced you that you didn't want to work with a large corporation. What about AeroVironment? Did you ever think about solidifying your relationship, not just being a consultant, but being an employee of AeroVironment? No, that had no appeal to me. I was I wanted to maintain my independence. Were you doing things on your own during these years as well? I was continuing my own UAV stuff for fun, et cetera, and I liked the freedom of being a consultant, being able to absolutely choose what projects I worked on. Well, I knew if I was an employee, I'd have much less freedom. Right, right. And I was better working in my own shop. In some ways, it was better equipped than whatever environment had for what I wanted to do. So it was more comfortable for me to work at home and, and interact with them when needed. And as you say, it was all in your home shop. You never developed a commercial space of your own? No, I didn't. It was always my home shop. Were you there right at the beginning when AeroVironment got, got involved with the, with the Sunracer project? Uh, not... I guess Alec took a bit of convincing for me to want to do a car. I wasn't all that enthusiastic about doing a car. I was more interested in airplane stuff at the time. So I remember when he approached me about, do I want to get involved in the Sunracer? It took a few meetings and some, some good talking up by Alec and others to get me to come on board. But eventually I did. And, and then I, I realized it was an interesting project and it was fun to do. And there, my experience with the photovoltaic inverter I'd done for Sandia Labs was actually very useful for the Sun Racer. I used some of the same concepts there and developed on them. What ultimately convinced you to join the Sun Racer project? Just the technology was interesting. I realized that I had the right background to be useful and, and possibly do quite a good job. Now, at this point, I know it's still early on, but intellectually, when you start working on Sun Racer, is that the point when you start thinking about electrifying vehicles? Uh, some. I mean, it was more to concern then. The sun race was so intense. We had eight months from the start of the project to having to win the race. that There wasn't a whole lot of time for thinking about much else. Uh, 
Now, did you have any uh -huh. interface directly with GM and their support of the Sunracer projects? Yes, I did. In fact, I did trips to the GM to the same research lab where I worked as an intern to, with some of the Sunracer projects. So, yeah, I went back and forth with their environment and the interfaces GM as needed. And I went to Australia for the race and, and was part of the whole support team. Alan, do you have a sense of why it was GM that was so intently interested in this technology? Like, where is Ford and Chrysler in all of this? Well, Ford, Ford had an entry also in the Sun race. So they were there, and I think Mitsubishi did. Various automakers did have entries. And I, I think that's why Air Environment did the... I, I, I wasn't aware at the time of what marketing efforts Air Environment did to GM to get that contract or what what contacts they used. But they did that work. I did not. Alan, as a so team... Somehow that... they secured the contracts in GM and called me after the fact. Uh -huh. As a team exercise... What was your area of expertise? What did you contribute to the development of the Sun Racer? All the power electronics. Uh, so everything from the battery to the motor and from the solar panel to the battery. So all the electronics that control those functions and, uh, and execute those functions. I wonder if you can talk... The motor, was developed, the motor itself was developed by GM, mm -hmm. by a GM research lab. And uh, I did all the electronics that made it work. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the engineering options about, you know, having a battery versus direct power from the solar panels right to the motor. Having a battery was an assumed condition. It was not, not anything we innovated. I mean, it, it's obvious with the solar powered car that you need to be able to have spurts of power that are beyond what the solar panel can do. And you need to have a battery to manage that. And and also the way the race was set up was obviously needed a battery because the morning and evening there are a few hours where you're allowed to charge with the car stationary and replenish the battery and then you could drive at other times of the day. So, I mean, the energy storage of the battery was kind of a given with conditions we were presented with. Now, in terms of the, the energy capacity of the solar panels, how much was known from previous applications of solar panels and how much were you figuring out in real time because this was a brand new application? It was a new application, but solar panels were already well established. I mean, it, what Air Environment did with, since it was the GM project, they teamed up with Hughes Aircraft and the satellite division who were very used to making solar panels and high grade ones. And Hughes Aircraft actually built the solar panel for the for the Sun Racer. Air Environment built the structure, built the Kevlar and fiberglass structure that supported it, but then they shipped that to Hughes Aircraft to put the solar cells on it. So we used the space grade solar cells, which were the best available at the time, and it's a bit of a funny story how we ended up with the gallium arsenide panel. Yeah, tell, got, tell me about that. How did the gallium arsenide panel come about? Because initially it was a silicon panel with the best space grade silicon cells you could buy, which ended up being a few hundred thousand dollars for the panel, I think, by the time it was all built and all the labor that went into it. So it was a relatively expensive panel with quite good performance was available at the time. Those cells were like 16% efficient. And uh, I think it was two or three months before the race, I was at a meeting with GM and we had already built a second car to have all spares, et cetera, to take with us to the race. So we had two cars and one solar panel. Because the solar panel was deemed expensive and the second car, once you built one, wasn't that hard to make another one. And I was at a meeting with, at, at Hughes Aircraft and I mentioned, well, since we have the second car and no solar panel for it, we should, you know, if something bad happens in the race, like we have a rollover accident or something, or a tree falls on the car and wrecks the solar panel, we're stuck. I, I suggested we get commercial grade solar panel solar cells and make an inferior panel for the back of the car, just to have something in case a disaster happened. And at the meeting, they said, oh, "Yeah, that's quite a sensible idea. Maybe we should consider it." And what happened is that then. Subsequently, they had internal meetings at Hughes Aircraft, and the cheap commercial-grade panel morphed into the experimental, extremely expensive Gab arsenide panel. They realized, well, since this one, we don't have to be, 
we don't have to be sure it'll work great. We can try something new and experimental on it. And they were kind of, they'd never built such a large gallium arsenide panel. And they realized, well, this would be an opportunity to get some experience doing it. They ended up spending, I think, more than a million dollars on the gallium arsenide panel. Alan, were you aware of some of the Sun Racers' competitors, the technologies that they were pursuing, or were you really operating in a no, we were looking at what they were doing, and we had some concerns about how competitive we would be. And that's what, one of the reasons that the, the Hughes aircraft decided to go out and do the Gamarasa panel, to make sure we had more of an edge. Did you see all of GM's interest and investment as, as a mandate, really, that you had to win this race? Yeah, it was clear that with this much, this effort, you better win it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was very clear. and put a lot of pressure on me because I was the only guy responsible for all the electronics that made the car move. And we actually built five sets of spares. We had two cars and five sets of spares for all the electronic components. Alan, I know this was such an intense project to work on. What was most fun for you during these eight months? I can't say any one thing. It was all a very intense challenging project. It was fun to be part of it. And having a real deadline made it everything more rational in terms of all of the management decisions. Everything had to happen quickly. Did you go to Australia? Did you want to go to Australia? Yeah, I wanted to go. I had, I mean, I was the only one who knew how to support the electronics part of it, the propulsion electronics part of it. So I had to go and it was a fun, it was a fun trip. It was kind of, when we got there, we all got kind of scared about how big the support effort was. There were like 50 vehicles, 50 official GM vehicles following the Sunracer down there throwing out back. Were you one of the drivers of the Sunracer? No, I was not. I didn't want that level of extra responsibility. I had enough already. <laughs> Did you drive it just in testing mode? Did you know what it felt yeah, like on the inside? I testing on the test track in Arizona quite a bit. I never drove it in the public roads. I did not. Again, I've stayed away from that level. The people who drove on the public roads are the ones who are going to be the drivers in Australia. Right. And I did not want that role. I wonder if you could give a sense of what it feels like to operate the Sun Racer. So if it's just at a standstill, what is it like to accelerate? How does that happen? It was kind of like not that different from a modern EV. It was very smooth, gentle acceleration. That car was zero to 60 in about 22 seconds, I think. So... It was nothing spectacular, but I remember when, uh, after the race, Road and Track did a road test of it just out of for entertainment and put it in their magazine. And they knew the acceleration time was about the same as the original Volkswagen minibus. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so it was slow, but wasn't completely ridiculous. <laughs> it was one-wheel drive, so it pulled a little bit to one side when you accelerated, but since the power is so low, it was quite manageable. And... It, it drove like, kind of like a big go-kart. I mean, it was extremely light with bicycle wheels and tires, but it, it drove okay. I mean, it was pretty pleasant to be in. And when the race started, where were you physically, and what was the best position for you to be in just to maintain control and awareness of what was going on with the electronics? Well, we were in an RV that followed the car down the road from uh, Darwin in northern Australia to Adelaide, where the race ended. So we were in a chase vehicle with all the telemetry display computers. There's a whole telemetry system, which I did not design. A, a, another consultant from Caltech who I knew designed a telemetry system, uh, John Gord, who is, I think, one year ahead of me at Caltech. Now, what is a telemetry system, and how does it? How are you using it in this application? It was monitoring the output from all the different segments of the solar panel, looking at temperatures of the motor and electronics and battery state of charge, et cetera. So all that was sent to Macintosh laptop, uh, for PCs. They weren't laptops at the time. They were regular PCs in the RV. So there's a whole crew in the, in the RV looking at the various conditions from the amount of sunlight, the state of charge of the battery, to the course, telling the driver what to do to optimize the race. Alan, maybe it's a silly question, but as long as you have sunlight... Can a solar-powered car run continuously? There's no need to charge anything? No, there's no need, but you have to adjust your speed so you keep the battery reserve enough for a hill that may be coming ahead or for the evening hours when you have less sun. So there's a whole management strategy for how, you, how much of the sunlight goes to the wheel and how much goes to the battery at any given time. 
Alan, coming off the starting line, what were some of the emotions running through you at that point? Whether all my electronics would blow up in the first day and they wouldn't finish the race, that was my concern. Yeah. <laughs> and in the end, nothing failed at all. Everything worked. We didn't have to use any of the spares. So it all worked out very well. But I remember when we were a fifth of the way through the race, I said, okay, if you maintain this failure rate, I'm okay because you got five sets of spares. <laughs> How far from the beginning of the race could you breathe a sigh of relief that you were guy, you guys were going to win this? I think by the end of the second day, it was obvious we were way ahead. And and what was the competition like? I mean, was Sunracer, did it just blow everyone out of the water? Was it close for a little while there? Uh, initially, the first half day, it was close because some of the other teams didn't understand battery management at all and had very large batteries that they were depleting. So they could go fast for the first, for most of the first day, and after that they were in big trouble, and we were not. We were, we had a very careful battery management strategy where everything went as planned. I wonder if you can explain that in some technical detail. What set the Sun Racers battery management apart? Well, Air Environment was had a whole bunch of people who were very skilled at looking at. You know, missions and understanding how to optimize vehicles. I mean, they'd done this for aircraft projects of various kinds, like their human-powered and solar-powered aircraft. They understood about energy management and strategy and, and operating procedures. So in that department, they're very strong. In fact, they had, I think, two mathematicians who were actually spent the whole time developing computer models of the race and the car, so they knew exactly how to optimize the performance. What was it like when you got to the finish line? Was there a huge celebration? Yeah, it was GM and 50 support cars. You can imagine they organized a pretty good celebration. <laughs> Tell me about it. What was the party like? I don't know. We were all so tired. I, I, after five days of very little sleep going across in an RV, I guess that was... <laughs> it was nice to have it be over <laughs> Alan what was your sense of GM's reaction to this at a strategic level what did this tell them was possible that might not have been before the race began that they could get a lot of advertising out of a, a couple million dollars or so budget for a special event that's what they really learned I think they learned very little about electric vehicles yeah. they never understood the technology that went into the Sun Racer. They never made a big effort to understand it in any way. After you so returned from us... It was a big PR effort for them, and as, as a PR effort, it was very successful. Yeah, yeah. When you returned from Australia, what did you do next? What was the next project to work on? I didn't do any project for a while until the EV1 came along. So in that in that interim year between eighty seven and eighty eight, you were working on your own stuff again. Yeah, I was just working on my own projects. I think quite a bit of the UAV stuff. I could just continue on my own. Now, were you gaining more customers? Was the UAV market expanding at no, that point? No, I had point? no other customers because again, the old, even the I was even partially on customer I had dealt with, and I I never had any other customers for UAV. Alan, I'm curious, what about since with your Caltech connections, what about JPL? Was JPL aware of what you were doing? Was that relevant for any of their missions? I had no contact with JPL. I didn't deal with them at all. Alan, tell me about your involvement at the earliest stages of GM Impact EV project. How did that get started for you? Me got started basically when I was called to a meeting at Air Environment to discuss my participation in, in, in such a project. And I think, actually, Wally Rappel reminded me of some stuff about the meeting that I'd forgotten. So my, my, my recollection about that meeting is a little bit fuzzy. And uh, Wally has, has a better recollection of, of what I said than I do, uh, <laughs> which is kind of strange. But that's the way it ended up. And apparently they were discussing a, what kind of vehicle to present to GM. And I guess I made some comments that it wasn't, if it wasn't a vehicle with reasonable performance, I wouldn't be interested. I wasn't interested in them like a, a milk delivery vehicle or something like that. That's, <laughs> that was not, that's not what I would be willing to work on. 
Alan... So apparently I said that. I don't remember that firsthand. <laughs> Wally was reminding me of that several times. Okay. <laughs> now, Alan, was your sense that the GM Impact Project only got started or was possible because of Sun Racer? Do you see these things as sequential? Yeah, they, they're sequential because the environment has shown is that it, it, its expertise with the Sun Racer, that it could actually deliver a project with reasonable budget and good results in the EV field. So when they proposed to GM to do the, the impact, they had some credibility and they managed to get some attention of, of some people at GM and at Hughes Aircraft. Who did you see at GM as really driving the support for the impact project? It was the guy at Hughes. Name? Oh my God! I, I I knew it yesterday, and all of a sudden it was getting me. With one engineer at Hughes Aircraft, I'm sure you've heard his name from Alec. There's uh, uh, Bob Stemple. Is that? No, Bob Stemple was the president of GM at the time. No, it wasn't him. It was. Uh, oh my God! The, the Hughes Aircraft fellow. He wasn't a GM person. Sorry. I wonder if you can explain the, the, the connection. I think at Hughes Aircraft, they recognize being more electronics oriented, they recognize the value of an EV development effort and to help support air environments marketing to GM. Now, what was the relationship between Hughes and GM at this point? I think GM had just bought Hughes Aircraft. So Hughes Aircraft was kind of new to the idea of being a partner with GM exploring what was possible. And how would an aircraft company slot in on an automobile project? Well, Hughes Aircraft wasn't really an aircraft company. It was more of an electronic satellite company. Mm -hmm. It's just the Hughes aircraft, a bit of a misnomer for what they did. Right, <laughs> right, right. And so they were heavily into electronics for all their satellite missions. And so that, that was an area of their expertise that GM really didn't have. Alan, did you have to be convinced yet again by Alec to get involved, or you were interested at this point? As soon as, soon as it became an interesting vehicle, so I was concerned that that thought had some chance of, of developing some innovative technology that would be useful in the long term. I, I was interested, so it, it didn't take much. I've already done that. The Sun Racer project had been fun as soon as this coalesced into something that was technologically viable and interesting in my opinion i was very happy to be on board now even at this early stage was the possibility that evs would provide some solutions on on emissions and and resources were you thinking yeah, about that, that? Was clear. I mean, that's why we were suggesting to gm as a way of you know having a lower pollution form of transportation and less energy intensive etc and there were various oil shortages at the time etc being discussed as a way to to get transportation running on something other than oil Alan, what about the, the decarbonization of the electric grid, the, the, the use of nuclear and wind and solar? Was that part of the, be, the beginnings of this, that an electrified grid would be good for electric vehicles? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I guess the, the talking point back then is if you build electric vehicles, in a way it's a flexible energy source. You can adjust the way you generate electricity as needed for various environmental and economic concerns. So it was kind of, we always promoted electric vehicles, even though electricity might right, right then may be mostly generated by coal, it didn't always have to be that way. Now, at the earliest discussions of the impact project, did you see it more as a novelty or was GM really committed even then to transforming a concept car into something that could be mass produced? No, they were not committed to that at all, and that was kind of forced upon them by California Air Resources Board, that I think the initial development team at Air Environment kind of worked to create a political situation where GM couldn't back out. Now, and, wouldn't GM, from a marketing perspective, wouldn't they have wanted to do this because people were interested in the technology that it would sell? That's not the impression we got. <laughs> uh-huh. They, were, they wanted to do something similar to what they'd done with the Sun Racer, to show how great they were and look at their wonderful engineering, even though it wasn't really theirs. But that's the image they wanted to convey was the impact. Alan, when did you first meet Wally Rappel? At Caltech in one of the machine shops. 
Oh, I see. And had you remained connected with him? Were you in contact over the years? Uh, on and off. Uh, for example, when I was at Teslaco doing the solar I- inverter for the for Sandia Labs, he was sent over by Sandia Labs from JPL to take a look at the project and give a report. So I dealt with him a bit on that. He came over for a few of the meetings to, to be a senior person overlooking this this development project. Alan, for you, what aspects of the Sunracer project were transferable and what had to be built from scratch for the impact? Well, some of the motor drive technology was similar, but it had to be scaled up tremendously. The Sunracer was uh, 7 kilowatts, about 10 horsepower, and we had to go up to you know, 130 or so horsepower for the, for the Sunracer. So it was a big scale up. And it was a little bit scary as an engineer to do such a big jump. I never done anything at that power level before. So I had to develop new techniques and, and learn how to do it. And that's one of the reasons the, sun, the impact had two motors. It was less scary to build two motors half the size and one large one in terms of all the technology, the motor and the technology to support it. What were the charging options that you considered for the impact? Uh on the impact, we realized, and I think Wally gave some input on that as well, and that it was possible once you built a motor control system to use the same electronics to make a charger with very few additional components. And so that's the route we went on the impact. It had a built-in charger that could do 20 kW. So with a lead-acid battery at the time, it could do a full charge in one hour. And how much range would that give you? About 100 miles if you drive down. Were lithium-ion batteries viable at that point? No, they didn't even really exist at any commercial level yet. Laptop computers weren't yet around, and nobody had lithium-ion batteries. It wasn't until around 2000 the laptop computers with lithium-ion batteries started to appear. What were some of the challenges in working with lead-acid batteries? They were way too heavy, <laughs> and they were not very reliable. So when you put a whole bunch of them together, one would always deplete before the other and limit the whole pack, and it was difficult to get lead-acid batteries to operate properly in a large pack. I and wonder if you can explain a little. Short. I wonder, Alan, if you could sp- explain a little how a lead-acid battery works. Again, I'm not a chemist. I was always somebody just using them. But uh, lead-acid batteries... are tolerant to overcharge in some senses that they're easier to deal with than lithium ions. You need less electronics around them to do a crude job. Uh, but they don't store very much energy and, and, the, and they don't charge that efficiently. When you charge them up, you only get maybe 80% of the energy back out when you, use, when you use them to propel the car. So they're not ideal in many ways, but it's all there was at the time. And most of the lead acid batteries in the world are meant are designed for starting cars, not for energy storage, for long-distance driving or long-term use. So it was difficult to find batteries that were suitable. And GM and FG ended up developing their own battery for the EV1, their own lead-acid battery, which was more tailored to a longer life and, and the beauty of, of an electric car. And they did a reasonable job. They worked quite well, I mean, within the limits of the technology. and. Towards the end of the EV1 program, they went to nickel metal hydride batteries that had somewhat improved performance. Alan, was anybody considering using solar panels on the impact? Was that considered viable at all? Not really, because on a normal car, you can only put a few hundred watts with a solar panel, and a car takes, again, a real car takes maybe 15. 10 to 15,000 watts to go down the road. So it's almost insignificant what you can get from a solar panel on a car. You have to park for a week to get any significant extra mileage out of it. (laughs) What were some of the considerations in terms of making a real car for everyday use? Did Did you use an existing chassis? Was everything built from scratch? No, everything was built from scratch. We had tried to optimize the aerodynamics and the weight because with lead acid batteries, you really couldn't make any mistakes and get a car that was all useful. So that was the 
the Impact and the EV1 both were very well optimized cars. It was a big effort went into the chassis design, and Air Environment managed to overrule most of the stylists to end up with quite a rational design. What were some cues that you were taking from other automobile manufacturers in terms of aerodynamics? In other words, were you Certainly looking... not, because they were all doing it so badly. Uh, we took cues from aircraft design and air environment work, and we worked in the Caltech wind tunnel, and uh, all sorts of effort went in on air, air environment side to create a body shape that could be both somewhat practical and also quite efficient. Alan, is this to say that even uh, uh, like a Porsche 911, that wasn't, that wasn't impressive aerodynamically to you? No, no, it's not. It's absolutely not impressive. In fact, it was kind of a joke in the industry that at the time, the Porsche 928 was more streamlined going backwards rather than forwards. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot to learn from the existing cars. <laughs> What about materials for the body? What were some of the new new materials that might have been available to you? Uh, the original impact was actually all fiberglass to reduce tooling costs, but done in a way to simulate an eventual aluminum structure, which is what the EV1 was. So that was all aluminum unibody, which GM was willing to experiment with, again, to try and meet the weight targets and to get the final performance they wanted. So we worked with fiberglass knowing it would be a a simulation of aluminum. What about tires? Were there any unique considerations with tires in driving an electric car? Again, you, you bias more towards efficiency than road holding or extreme performance of any kind. So again, we worked with various people at GM to select the best commercially available tires for that application. And I uh, I think they might have eventually got some custom tires from Goodyear or some other automakers that just make small improvements. But yeah, they're, they're obviously the, the characteristics you want for an electric car, especially if all you have is a lead-acid battery, is you want something in the tire that rolls as efficiently as possible. I'm very interested in the idea that this is going to be a car that can be designed for everyday use. What were some of the things that you and your team were sensitive to in terms of making it attractive, making it fun to drive, making it easy to drive? Well, we saw from the Sunracer that, you know, things like having the one pedal driving with regenerative braking was made with a very nice sort of driver interface. And we suddenly put that into the, into the impact. And we're probably one of the first ones to demonstrate that in a passenger vehicle that you could do one pedal controls in an electric car, which is kind of slowly becoming the norm. And uh, and just you know, making a car to drive smoothly with no single speed gear reduction, no gear shift. And, you know, trying to do the best we could to take advantage of the new technology and over the relatively crude propulsion interface with an internal combustion engine. Was it a similarly high pressure environment as the Sun Racer? What kind of time constraints were you working under? Uh, not as definite time constraints, so it wasn't a super high pressure environment, which we knew we had to, we had to get it done reasonably quickly. But it wasn't like an absolute race where if the car is not ready, you lose the race. <laughs> so it was a bit more relaxed, and we had some more time to do R and D more carefully to optimize various components, and I spent a lot of time in the motor design and the electronics areas to get that right. And Air Environment spent a lot of time on the body and, uh, and chassis design. And they had helped from, from GM engineers as well on the body design, transform the Air Environment's you know, concept into tooling and that was amenable to the eventual aluminum fabrication. So that was, uh, and the similar suspension design was also in conjunction with General Motors suspension engineers to get a design that was both aerodynamic and lightweight with all the suspension components were hidden up inside the body. So the bottom could be streamlined. So various things like that were done quite carefully, working with air environment kind of as the guiding force and GM with some of the practical knowledge. Was money no object? I mean, what were some of the budgetary constraints in the development stage of the impact? My impression was the money was enough to do whatever we wanted. Uh, I wasn't really involved in the money discussion, but it seemed to never be an issue. On the other hand, Air Environment does work pretty cheaply and efficiently, so it wasn't 
a huge effort. It was, you know, 20 people are still working on the car at Air Environment. Alan, given that you had the resources that you needed, what are some examples where you could really push the envelope in terms of the engineering, doing stuff at the best possible level, not necessarily with regard to belt tightening? I guess it, it was always, I was kind of alone on the electronics, so I, I kind of, whatever, I need materials or things fabricated, et cetera, it was never an issue. I could always just get it done. But they didn't hire a team of five people like me to help me. Not that, that they did not do. Uh, <laughs> so the, I'm sure there were some constraints at the air environment end, but I really didn't see them as far as I was concerned. I could do whatever I suggested and was basically allowed. Ellen, what about some of the regulatory challenges or considerations? Were there anything that you needed to take, take special concern of to make these cars well, street legal? Uh, at the time, we were, we were thinking about it down the road. We'd have to meet crash worthiness, et cetera. But obviously, with a fiberglass car, it was not crash worthy. It was just a mock-up of what the final design would be. But I think there was some, when they laid out how the various parts were designed, that was all, I think, looking forward to eventually having to meet all the various safety requirements. So obviously some solutions that would have been grossly inappropriate were not allowed. And the same with the electronics. Uh, there were some issues with uh, charging, the way the charger was built, where we weren't quite meeting some of the requirements for plugging into outlets in terms of ground currents, et cetera, which I was working on to address. So, I mean, some of those I was aware on the initial prototypes, you weren't all the way there, but we we're pursuing various efforts to make sure we could get there. From the very beginning to when you could actually drive the impact around, what was the timeline? How long did that take? I can't tell you exactly. I don't remember that precisely. In the order of a couple, two years or so. Mm-hmm. And the first impact couldn't be driven in the rain. So the air cooled and the air came in from the front and went through the electronics in a way that wasn't safe if it was raining hard. So it's an example of the shortcuts we took. We knew that eventually that could be solved, but we didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> Alan, do you have a clear memory of driving it for the first time? I, I know no one event stands out. I remember being... As soon as it started to be complete, we were driving and had some troubles with electronics failing and having to tow the car home or limp home and some, with only one motor running and not two because there were some issues with failures and they get to learn how to make it more reliable. So there, there were all sorts of problems when we first started driving it and we were learning as we were going. And actually the very first tests were not in the impact body we put everything in a gm van all the same drive components just to be able to drive it around before the car was ready alan as a matter of collaboration tell me about working with wally what what were your areas of expertise what were his how did you work together with wally uh his area was the motor design part which i had very low experience with so he provided the basic starting point for the motor design and then i was heavily involved in the testing of the motor because test the motor you have to have electronics to run it and together with wally we we evolved the motor design to, to solve some minor issues and improve the performance so it was a collaborative effort with wally on the motor with him taking the initial lead on the design he'd done some work at jpl on similar motors and so he had a good theoretical and practical understanding of that type of technology and how, how involved at the day-to-day -day level, the working level, were people from Hughes and GM? Were they giving advice? Were they telling you what to do? Or it was more but detached had, than that? Hughes had almost no input during the impact program until the very end of it when we transferred the technology over to them after the car was fully demonstrated. Uh, the GM people in the chassis and suspension design had more input. But uh, the electronic side, the Hughes aircraft base, had no answer. Did you see this at that early stage as something that would be widely adopted? I was hoping it would be, but I saw the, the split personality of GM that was willing to fund this, but really didn't want to adopt it. So it was clear from the beginning that it was going to be an uphill battle.
Now, is your sense that the the various lobbyists that would have been aligned against mass production of EVs, do you see their influence right from the beginning? I saw within GM management there was reluctance to embrace the new technology. I mean, an example is when we were at the test track filming the promotional video for the auto show when the impact of the first fiberglass prototype was shown at the LA Auto Show. We had a license plate on the car that said the future is electric, which we thought was appropriate for a, proportional, for a promotional video. But we were at the GM test track with their film crew, and the PR head came along and said, that's too strong a statement, it has to go. And they replaced it with a generic dealer license plate. Were you aware if Ford or Chrysler was paying attention? Not directly. I, I'm sure there was. I mean, when GM started to show the car and at auto shows, et cetera, around the world, they took it to Geneva, Switzerland as well. I mean, I'm sure it got. You know, we, we suddenly saw other automakers coming by and looking and noticing. So obviously, we had their attention to some degree. But what happened within those organizations, I don't have any detailed knowledge. What kind of press did the impact get? Uh, more than GM wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, GM was happy to show it off, but really didn't want to be committed to build anything. And then they ended up kind of realizing if they didn't build some sort of production vehicle, it would look very bad. Did you have an idea at the time that the that the impact would lead to the EV1? We were hoping it would, and that was the whole idea. And that was the intent of the program among the people who were working on it. But that was not really the intent of GM as an organization. Given all of these uphill battles, what is your understanding of how the EV1 came into being? Uh, it came to being, again, with a mixed commitment. For example, they made sure not to sell them. They were all short-term leases so they could stop the program at any time. And it was clear they were very cautious and didn't want to commit resources long term were you involved in the ev1 at all uh no by the time it i was involved at a point where i transferred all the technology that worked on to hughes aircraft and then i basically stepped back and it was no longer involved the, the effort from the impact to the ev1 i was not directly involved in anything as an outsider i wonder if you can comment what was different about the EV1 and what was straight adopted from the impact concept? Uh, the electronics was considerably uh, evolved because they, they was, I did a lot of stuff with the analog electronics. That was my area. They went much more heavily in the digital direction, which is the thing to do, but it wasn't within my development capabilities at the time. So they did a lot of changes that were kind of needed for a production vehicle, which were appropriate. And some of the efficiency stuff in the drivetrain didn't get quite right, but it wasn't too far off. So they did some stuff pretty well, and the whole the chassis was pretty much faithful to the original concept. So that that they stuck with. Now, did you have the opportunity to remain involved in the EV1? Yes, if I'd wanted to join GM or Hughes Aircraft, I probably could have, but I kind of felt my role was over. But since it became a a thing with hundreds of engineers and this enormous project, I don't fit in very well in those environments. So, so I, I knew it was better to stay away. It's the same sensibility, even from an undergraduate, that you always wanted to remain on the outside as a consultant. Yeah, I mean, I like doing the initial creative part of these projects and showing a concept that nobody's really done before. And then when it becomes a, a big corporate development effort, I tend to run away. <laughs> Alan, last question for today as a segue to the founding of AC Propulsion. Just for you, intellectually, scientifically, even politically, with regard to your concern for the environment and resources, was the idea behind AC Propulsion a direct outgrowth from your work on impact, or were there other things going into your motivations at that point? No, it's a direct outgrowth because I saw the way GM was going with the EV1 program and saw they were technically they were doing some things in a direction I didn't agree with. 
example, their charging infrastructure and some other issues. And I realized I had some ideas that could be developed in a significantly different direction to, to be quite viable. And that's when I decided to, to start AC Propulsion. And in fact, GM approached me when they heard of me starting to do my own electric car effort and offered to fund me as long as all the work I did would be owned by GM. And I refused because I was worried about getting into the same trap where they could eventually make the final decisions that went ahead, what went ahead and what didn't. So I turned them down. Well, Alan, and that's... I, a, that's and a, I started AC Repulsion with no external funding, just my own savings. Oh, wow, that's great. Alan, that's a great place to pick up for next time when we'll get to the beginning of AC Propulsion.